Welcome to another episode of Threads of Enlightenment. I'm re- very excited. I can't contain my excitement. And so um, I cannot wait for you guys to meet this uh, guest that we have. But first, I want to welcome uh, our guests here because I personally believe that they are showing up with very expensive commodities that they are willing to share with us at this time. And I want to thank them for it. The first is their time. Time is a precious thing. It is being misused by so many. But once you realize the value of it, everything changes. The other is their story. The story houses much wisdom, much pain, much sacrifice, much uh, uh, glory, as I say. And so they are coming and trusting us that we would create a space by which they can now deposit their wisdom so that you and I will become better human spirits on this planet. Shannon, thank you so much for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate you having me. Your energy is contagious. I I love it. I am excited, as I mentioned. Tell the people those things that you have given birth um, as a result of your journey and what you have today. Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> There's so much, so much to say. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Shana Francesca. And the core of my work is that I help people live more joyful, connected lives through the principles of life design. And life design to me is the understanding that we get to choose the story that our life tells. And we are, through our daily action, writing the story of our lives, whether we take conscious action of understanding that or not. Mm-hmm. And when we get really clear on the story that we want our life to tell, we then can get really curious about the ways in which that can happen for us. And we can get very intentional about the decisions that we make every day because our life is not built on the big decision. Our life is built on the everyday actions that are stacked one on the other, just small interactions as much as like, you know, the, the food we eat, the things we put on our body, the things we surround ourselves with, as much as we have control over those things, understanding that we do have a choice in the decisions that we're making in within the context of our. Yeah. Um, and and when we get really intentional about the story that we want our life to tell, we can then begin to understand that we spend currently two thirds of our life inside of our home. That's a whole nother thing that I wish would change, but we spend two thirds of our life inside of our home. And when we understand that we are every day telling the story of our life and we are spending two thirds of our life inside of our home, we recognize that that becomes the stage from which we tell the story of our life. And that can become really powerful because the spaces we spend time in become a direct reflection of our beliefs about ourselves and they can become a vision board for our life. And recognizing the people that we are engaging with, the people we welcome into our home, right? We start to get much more intentional about the energy we surround ourselves with of all the things, because Mm -hmm. every material thing, including ourselves, everything we can touch and see is made of energy. And when we recognize that that is passing back and forth between everything that is in our lives, we start to recognize that we are truly powerful, that Mm -hmm. every decision we make has a ripple effect on every other living being. And that when we take ownership of that, it can be a little scary at first. It can be a little scary at last. But yes. we start to recognize that fear is a natural part of life. It's not about yeah. it. It's it's a way of showing us when we push past our boundaries, push past our place of current. And when we are getting curious, when we are leaning into connecting to the unfamiliar, to the unknown. And that is a place of growth and a place of deeper understanding and a place of deeper wisdom. And in fact, really getting down to the root of who we actually are and being able to recognize that who we actually authentic selves is meant to take up space in this world. And when I say take up space, I do not mean take space away from other people. <clears throat> I mean, that we begin to recognize what space is meant for us, space is meant for other people. And instead of taking from other people, we start to co-create with others. We start to recognize that we are on this earth to build community together and do things in with. We are not here to compete with one another. The world is in fact a vertical, is not vertical, it is built vertically. It's meant yeah. to be horizontal. We're meant to lock arms with one another. We're meant to do this life together. We're not meant to do it alone. Um, and we start to, to recognize the role that we're playing in those power structures that currently oppress so many people, including ourselves, whether we're willing mm-hmm. to recognize. And then we become, when we are in community together, we can't compete with yeah. when we're truly in authentic community, not competing, we're not taking space away from someone else. We recognize space we're meant to occupy is equally for us and is equally power. And no one else can occupy our space and we cannot occupy theirs and truly be powerful. Um, so that is the work that I do. And I am currently doing... Um, 
you know, sharing that work through podcasts, through workshops that I have on my website and um, <clears throat> working on, uh, I've been doing some keynote speaking and we're developing that even further and expanding that because my, my background is being an interior designer. Uh, and I started to recognize that this is the way that I was working with my clients and that this conversation around designer life was much more powerful than just designing people's homes. Mm -hmm. um, and in many ways, I had to question the role I was taking in designing people's homes and being an interior designer because um, it, it in many ways contributes to a consumer society. And I wasn't working that, but it was making it harder to find clients. But yeah. the clients I was finding um, and the clients I do work with, we were in very powerful conversations and they were just describing me to other people as their interior designer and their life coach. And I was like, you do? <laughs> and then I really truly realized there was so much more power in yeah. this conversation around life design than there was in just identifying as an interior designer. I gave myself permission to take up the space I was occupy um, in sharing this larger conversation. I think that is awesome. When you when I was looking at your information and and um, I'm listening to you now and your profession, previous profession, I thought, yeah. wow, what a perfect fit um, mm -hmm. in my mind because you were an interior designer, uh, yeah. quote unquote, and you're still an interior designer. Um, exactly. The human being is a yeah. house. And so you yeah. are still um, that designer, but um, the location as far as uh, uh, where you're designing has changed. But I think it's it was a beautiful metaphor, not even metaphor, it was just a beautiful picture. When I was reading all your information, I thought, wow, yeah. here is uh, this woman. People are inviting her into their home, into their yeah. interior yeah. for her to ha assist in the redesigning of their interior. And she's doing the very same thing today in her workshops that yeah. she has. Um, uh, yeah. Shanna, I want to go back to a little and talk to us um, your entrance into this world within your family unit. Mm -hmm. And I tell people, I, um, I know people think I'm crazy when I mention it uh, this way when I put this label to it. But uh, Shana, sometimes I call it the lab. And we have these scientists that are working off of a thesis that they had designed and put together based on their encounter from their mother, their father, their grandfather, yeah. and all those other, and society as a whole. And then they began to um, uh, put the practicality of that thesis out into your life and my life. And sometimes it is a mess. Yes. So talk to us about <laughs> your family unit and how was it um, once you came into that first space that we occupy mm -hmm. once we come onto this planet is that family yeah. unit. Talk to us. Yeah. The word that comes to mind is treacherous. Um, mm. It was a treacherous beginning. Um, my earliest memories are of trauma. Um, I... Um, so for those of you who don't know, I, I'm a nerd, I'm neurodivergent, so I'm autistic and have ADHD. Um, and that was something that I was diagnosed with very early on at five. Um, but even then my parents didn't have the tools to understand that at that time it was, it was seen as a handicap, mm -hmm. um, and not, uh, a superpower. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there, my parents didn't really have a lot of tools and they themselves were very, and grew yeah. up in abusive households themselves, different types of abusive households. <clears throat> um, my mother grew up in a very, very um, waspy home um, and in a very wealthy area. And then my dad grew up like lower middle class, very work hardworking people. Um, but it was in his family, it was spare the rod and spoil the child. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so really that's just a nice, way of saying, you know, abuse your children yeah. <laughs> to you. So hitting all people is uh, also not okay. Um, but uh, unfortunately, sexual assault is a is a theme in my life. Um, and so there was all these things at play. I didn't have true understanding of who I was because the world around wasn't built for me. Mm -hmm. um, neurotypical people, um, you know, just constantly were telling me that I needed to be like them and yeah. I didn't know how because I can't I literally cannot um and so there are all these things at play with living in an abusive household um having you know sexual assault be my very first memory um from the at the age of three and then having parents who were ill-equipped to deal with any of it um and and became abusive themselves uh and so 
all of these things were at play. And I came to recognize that if I was going to choose to stay a part of this world uh, and stay inside my, that I didn't see a single person's world whose life I wanted, period. Hmm. There wasn't one. And hmm. so I was going to have to find a reality outside of the one that I understood and that I was given access to. And I found access to that through books. Mm -hmm. um, and began to expand my understanding of the world and began to surround myself with post-it notes um, that had inspirational quotes on. I, we used to get this thick old J.C. Penney's catalog in the mail, mm -hmm. and I would take that and I would circle all the things that I wanted to be part of this new life I was imagining for myself. And I would dog ear the pages that all those things yeah. were circled on so I could go back and I could page through and I could look. And it was really a vision board for my life before vision boarding was a thing. Yeah. Um, and I remember it used to make my dad so angry that I was imagining outside of this one. He, he would he would take it away and say that it wasn't going to do me any good to imagine any different life than I was living. Um, wow. And I knew intrinsically that he How he old was were you, Shane, when you were um, developing this mindset of outsideness from uh, your tribe, as you say, your family? How yeah, old were that's you? A, that's a good question. I would guess, and I, I kept journals all of my life. So at some point, I'm going to write about my life. And, <laughs> I thought and you I'll should. And I'll be able to go back. Yeah, and go back and look at all my journals that I have, lots of yeah. them. Um, that's probably the scariest part to my family. But I it was about 12 or 13 Okay. Um, at the time, probably about mm -hmm. 12. Um, at the age of 12, I was forced to take a chastity pledge in front of my... I grew up evangelical Christian, so I was forced to take a chastity pledge in front of my 2,500-person church by my wow. own sexually assaulted teen. So there was a lot at play. I was being, being you know, by a pedophile. I was being inside my own home. There was so many things at play. And, and so I, I literally, when I say I was trying to figure out if there was a stay inside yeah. my own, I, I mean that. Um, unaliving myself was a very real, it was a very real thought for a very long time. Um, and, and so around the age of 12, I was like, I've got a choice. Either I mm -hmm. stop being or I find a better way. And, and I just kept searching out a better way. And I, ser I sought out mentors in my head mm -hmm. through music, through books, um, you know, just taking looks, you know, yeah. walking meditation is a big part. Like I didn't recognize or have that language at that time. I wasn't yeah. allowed to call yeah. meditating mm -hmm. because I was Christian. Yeah. Um, and, but I would go for long walks and I would just breathe. <sighs> Yeah. And or listen to music through my Walkman. You know, back then you'd have your like CD yep. in your Walkman <laughs> and it would skip and you'd like try to walk so carefully with it. Um, and and listening to different people and, and surrounding myself with these quotes and trying to gain access to the reality. I, there's I, in the book Tribal Leadership, there's this beautiful understanding that I came to is that the language change happens in language and mm -hmm. we can recognize change in our life as our language changes the words that yeah. we use. And so I grew up being told that life sucks and then you deal with it. literally that was wow. my father's life sucks and then with it. And I needed to get to a place where I understood that life didn't suck. My life sucked. Yeah. And the important distinction in that is that when we recognize that, that life being terrible is not pervasive, but it mm -hmm. is pervasive in our life. That means it's yes. not pervasive in other people necessarily. Yeah. Right. And we can get to a different place in our life. And once I got to that place, that was hope. That's yeah. hope. That's yeah. the beginning of crafting a new reality. And then I started to recognize that every time something really traumatic would happen inside of the home, I would organize something. I would rearrange furniture. I would, I would change my physical environment. Mm -hmm. And I started to recognize now look back and I, it was like I was changing. It was like I was changing my association with what was and yeah. resetting that stage and, yeah. and preparing for a new reality as best as I could and as much as I had access to as, you know, a 13, 14, 15 year old kid, which was just like rearranging my bedroom. Yeah. But resetting that stage was truly important because it reset my understanding of reality. That is um, so much is packed within what you have just said. I know the hypocrisy within the evangelical church as far as some of the things that they teach and yet they do and i i grew up in one and um i had to learn there is a the difference within the christian system i believe that there's eastern christianity and that's what jesus is all about uh, because christianity is an eastern religion then you have the western christianity which was forming a different thing and they believe much different than what yeah. jesus is teaching so yeah. It um it is an incredible um dichotomy that this young 
woman had to uh, face as an individual to seize and to have you um, make that type of commitment. Um, I'm sure that they carry, carried a, uh, it could have, I'm not sure if it did, a, a sense of shame built in within that as well oh, in yeah. front of all of these people um, making these um, announcement that's it's a private thing. Um, but I love uh, what it began to do to you, Shana, as it caused this young woman to become starting the seed of becoming stronger in the sense where she now is able to, to start creating and rearranging her world, going yeah. on the meditation, the Bible that uh, the evangelicals seem to miss talks yeah. about men and women meditation. meditating all day long. And it actually yes. says, yeah. meditate on my word day and night. So I just don't understand mm -hmm. where that came from. And that's why I say <laughs> there's Western Christianity and Eastern Christianity. It's two yes. different yeah. very, very, very different. Um, and so uh, uh, here you are. You began to implement one of the most powerful tools within personal growth and not knowing it was that form of meditation. You found it through your walking meditation where you began to um, take that breath, as you said, and I tell people that breath is the entrance to the spirit realm, to that deeper realm within us that um, we get a chance to explore through our deep, deep thoughts and our intentional thinking process yeah. by which we began to investigate. So here you are, this girl, 15 years old, being traumatized in so many different ways, and uh, you began to change. Talk to me as you are noticing your skill set in designing, and um, what agreement did you make with yourself at that stage of your life that, okay, this is going on, I am going to head in this direction, meaning yeah. um, how did you manage in school with, mm. I mean, all of this happening, she and this yeah. The world is spinning, girl. Talk yeah. to us as how you, did you interact with uh, your classmates, male and female, and how did yeah. you begin to look at Shana, the, the young girl? Oh, gosh, there was a, an immense amount of shame. I was very aware that other people were not experiencing the world the way that I was, mm -hmm. um, or at least they weren't being honest about it. Yeah. Um, they didn't necessarily feel safe to... Facebook life, I call it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, Facebook didn't happen until I was in college. Um, so <laughs> yeah. um, at that point, social media wasn't even a thing. Um, yeah. Barely cell phones were a thing. I didn't even get my first cell phone until I was 17. So mm -hmm. um, I was going, I, we were, like I said, I grew up evangelical Christian and I to a, a church that also had a school. So mm -hmm. um, I was very much being indoctrinated. Um, yeah. And that continued into my teen years. And so there was these two aspects of myself. One, that that something wasn't right, but I didn't feel like I had, I was unsafe to question it. It's not even that I didn't feel like I had the right, because I, I was rebelling um, yeah. constantly. Um, mm -hmm. Because I was just trying to carve out space that was authentic to me. And I was told that was wrong. And I'm going to go to hell. And I was being rebellious. And I wasn't the authority God put over me. Yeah. Um, and so there was a lot of questioning, does this God that you speak of even exist? because yeah. I don't think it does. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't think it does. And now I'm sure that that God that I was raised to believe doesn't yeah. exist. Um, there was these two parts where I felt like maybe if I just get deeper into the indoctrination, maybe if I just get deeper into the beliefs, then something will click and I'll get better and I'll be mm -hmm. better and I'll do better, right? Better based on what everybody's telling the me. The programming, yeah. has to look like, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there was part of me that leaned into that indoctrination and that propaganda. Um, and part of me was just dying inside. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I was surrounded by people. And even when I told people what was being done to me, it there was no shock or disbelief. Mm -hmm. It was literally just like, okay. And then we yeah. just moved forward with our life. So there was no one validating my experience there was yeah. no one saying that shouldn't happen to you that shouldn't be being done to you that's not okay there was no one saying that. Wow. and it felt not okay to me right and so the fact that what was being done to me was in fact being normalized by mm -hmm. it not 
yeah. was exceptionally powerful in a negative way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and not being able to find someone to really talk about with it and them to be like, you need to get out of this situation and I'm going to help you. There was none of that. Um, and so I felt like maybe this is normal. Maybe this is what I'm supposed to, maybe I'm not close enough to God. And so I really leaned into it. I was a teenager, right? I just, yeah. I didn't have, I didn't know. I didn't yeah. know I could yeah. choose differently and I didn't know how to choose differently. And I didn't have support to choose differently. My entire community was this harmful community. And so, yeah, I, I did good in school. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I was in the national honor society, but it was like, I had to lean into being really intelligent. Yeah. Um, to kind of make it okay, like to ignore what was happening. Yeah. To <laughs> like manage was your life. Done. Yeah. Yeah. I had to have something that was succeeding yeah. that I could cling to. Yeah. So that I could make something feel okay. And, yeah. um, and so that's what I did. You know, I. It becomes a part of your coping mechanism. Yeah. They say you, you have to find mm -hmm. something in order yes. to cling on to. Yes. To give you yeah. your hope, uh, you had mentioned yeah. also books, and I tell people, uh, Shana, the, the the words within those pages house tremendous amount of power. Yeah. Um, when one is ready, uh, Jesus makes a statement: "Those who have ears, let them hear." Yeah. And it tells me that there is an onus upon the hearer to be in a state of readiness to yeah. accept what was being said. And so, yeah. those pages, when ready are able to jump from those pages and land in the spirit of the person in the mind, the soul, that part that will make you and I uh, began to create and um, began to plan and move forward. Yeah. As you are excelling in, in school and moving through the um, your life as you are walking on this planet, and um, I know you chose um, interior design. Yeah. What made you, when you are transitioning from college, from uh, high school to college, what made you pick that, even though you were arranging? What was the agreement that you had said within yourself, uh, yeah. this young woman, that she made an agreement? Because that agreement then will now guide you in you pursuing this um, part of your skill set. You know, I thought about this for so long and, and I think the reality is I needed I needed a creative outlet. I've always been an artist in some way, mm -hmm. shape, or form. I started dancing when I was eighteen months old and writing and kept journals and, and so I think I was genuinely looking for a way to connect with my creativity and figure out how to make a living. Yeah. Um and and that felt really, really good to be able to, you know, create space for people. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it also felt like it connected me to a reality that like I could create realities for other people that I couldn't afford myself yeah. yet. Right? Mm -hmm. But I, I got to figure out how to craft realities. It was like a school of sorts for me to figure out how to craft reality, yeah. um, doing it for other people so that I could figure out how to do it for myself. Um, and I think I think that's part of all of our spiritual path is the thing yes. that we kind of choose to do for others is the thing that we're also learning how to yes. do ourselves. Um, and so I think that became a, a huge part of it is I recognized how vital space was for my mm -hmm. mental health and creating that space and how powerful it was, whether I had that much yet or not. Yes. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I absolutely leaned into it because I, I felt something there. I felt a create a connection to my creativity and I felt my voice being able to be used in some way, shape or form mm -hmm. um, in that space. Um, it was either that or be a lawyer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So it was like between lawyer, architecture, engineer, or interior designer. And I felt like an interior designer kind of allowed my creativity and was a safer space woman at that time. Very many yeah. female architects are still aren't, not mm -hmm. in the US. Um, and, uh, and there was five lawyers in my family. So uh, that felt like a natural path, but somehow interior design, you know, and yeah. I'm very thankful that it did. <laughs> I think um, your clients and I believe the world will thank you that you did as well as they as they begin to tap into you, um, the being that is you through your workshops and so forth. And I yeah. think I was listening to, I told you I was listening to your six minute video and I'm yeah. thinking, why isn't there a book 
<laughs> that's yeah. the only thing. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's the, it's not there's not a book yet. We've yeah. got a you know I'm working to build that audience and to because I feel like we need to be re we need to be introduced or reintroduced. I don't think what I'm saying is actually new. No, I think it it's, isn't. it's intrinsically inside of us. What I'm yes. doing is putting my finger on something we already know. Yeah. Right. And I'm giving it the space and saying, let's give the space to let it expand and take up space in our life. Let's let that knowledge, that deeper inner knowing out. Let's let it take space in the world. Cause right now it's clouded under so many layers of capitalism and white supremacy and, yeah. and, and, and all these systems of oppression and that are robbing us of our voice. And so when we start to peel those, then we start to understand, Oh, wow. There's a lot of power in me just being me. And that's why yeah. all these systems keep telling me to not be anything, to not be me at all, right? Because they're yes. taking that and that's, take that power yeah. back. Yes, we, that's we, when we you become, change, you know, oh, right? that's... So the book is coming. It's just a matter <laughs> of, of, of first opening people up to the, and getting comfortable and familiar with being themselves. We got to, you know, work up to it. <laughs> <laughs> the principles are all there. It's been there from yeah. the beginning of time. I think the difference... Um, Shana, is that you're bringing your personality, your energy yeah. with it. And that yeah. is why I think life, it makes life so much entertaining and so much more beautiful because yeah. even though the principles exist for so long that each yeah. individual has a part to play and to present that yeah. information based on who they are. And yeah. that to me is the most beautiful thing. If people can realize the beauty in that, but when you go against the programming that society is a whole, and again, some of the entities that I believe that contribute to the programming that we have to walk through life in order to at some point stand and say, no, I am is yeah. we have the family. We have, um, educational system, religion. We have corporate America. And again, yeah. as I mentioned, we have society and the fence, the invisible fence that I tell people that exists is normality. That mm -hmm. fence of normal and our parents and grandparents and people tell us, you're not normal. You need to behave this way. This is what normal yeah. looks like. Yeah. And you're looking at them going, I don't know anything about that. I can't relate I, I can't. to that. Yeah. And I literally they, can't. <laughs> yeah, they, and then they call you a rebel because you right. are not a part of their belief system as to the yeah. programming. And so yeah. um, that is, as we move through our life and we deal with each one of those institutions, yeah. as we have to learn how to let go and be and uh, walk yeah. into the space of the I am. So here you yeah. are, you're walking you're in college and uh, you're in your space as uh, you're studying your called um, profession, as you 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 uh, declared. Um, yeah. How did this woman, this young woman now, began to look at herself as an individual being away? Um, you're still in the in the rearview mirror of the family, but as you began to walk and began your steps towards independence if you yeah. will how did yeah. you begin to look at you as an mm -hmm. individual on this planet yeah so um i i entered college at 17 so i was very very young um wow. and uh and so there was a lot still and i went to county college at first so that i could mm -hmm. pay for my my you know so i could manage the cost of college yeah. <laughs> um, and so i was still living i lived at home throughout so i was wow. uh, and, and so that formed a college experience living on campus. But, um, but when I went to, when I left County College and before your college, the people then that I was being exposed to were very different, right? Because yeah. I grew up in a church that then had a school and that was very yeah. encapsulated controlled. experience, yeah. mm -hmm. very controlled. And so um, I think not allowing me to live on campus was my father's way of trying to maintain control yeah, maintain. over the narrative yeah. in my mm -hmm. life. Yeah. Um, but it didn't. <laughs> well, you still have that chastity thing that they made you, um, and going outside so of that, I, they I began to work. Yeah. So no one knew that my father, um, what my father had done for three years. Yeah. I was 18. I was a, I was a, a sophomore in college before anybody. Knew. Um, wow. but I had conveniently lost the chastity ring because yeah. 
first of all, I believe virginity is a construct. Yeah. Um, it's not real. Um, but also at that point, I wasn't. So, yeah. um, so what was the point in having What was the point? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so I conveniently lost it. Um, I, I actually did not purposely lose it. It lost itself. It stopped being on my body and I didn't even look for it. Yeah. Um, because I knew it wasn't a part of who I was and I, I didn't believe in what it represented. It was a form of control. Um, and so going to college, I met all kinds of people and I was exposed to just, just a wide variety of people from a wide variety of experiences. And, and it allowed me to start to question, mm -hmm. to feel like my questioning was yeah. right? like yeah. that, that actually my experience within my life up until that point was not okay. And yeah. it was the first time that I was allowed to say that out loud. And people were like, holy, wow. you, what, what was done to you? What, ha yeah. what happened? That's not okay. You yeah. know, it was the first time that I felt validated mm -hmm. in that. And so it began a really long process that I continue to this day of deconstructing and decolonizing my belief systems and yeah. recognizing um, that my voice is meant to take up space, but it, it's taken a long time. You, undoing 24 years of programming in your life mm -hmm. takes a long, long time. Long. <laughs> um, long time. It's not yeah. an overnight thing and we wish that it was, but when yeah. I have come, I know that I know now in a form of which you're understanding that I, I grew up in a cult yeah. um, and I have CPTSD from growing up in an abusive household, but I also have CPTSD from religious trauma. Yeah. And so recognizing that, um, Trauma is stored in our body. It rewires our brain. It rewires mm -hmm. your body function. It changes your heartbeat. Yes. Um, there is, it changes the way that you breathe. It, it literally changes your body and is stored in our body, in our yes. tissue. And so when you begin to understand that, um, you recognize that this is not an overnight process and it can't be. Um, I think it even goes deeper than that, Shane. I think it, it is stored within um get to the space where it goes into the genes and into yes. the blood streams yes, it into does. the cellular yeah. level because yeah. epigenetics it manifests, teaches us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it manifests in um all the different types of disease or diseases as we state yes. and yes. um because it goes to that level and yes. it has yeah. to come out and it comes yes. out in these forms and yeah. um, I've known people that are able to heal themselves through yeah. meditation and through yeah. all of the different more um, uh, ways that are Modality. exist out yeah. there that yeah. are outside of quote unquote the healthcare system. That yeah. uh, is another system that is designed to uh, curtail Perfect. the human, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the human being yeah. as an individual. So yeah, I think it goes yeah. to that level. And it manifests all day long. I mean, science is showing, uh, you know, through the understanding of epigenetics that we pass down trauma through our. Yes. And so then uh, one generation, just the way you said when we were talking before we started this is our sort of recording is that. Um, yeah. Has yes. Yes. That changed their body stored in there. And so yep. then even us coming into the world and being a part of their world, we experience trauma just because we came out of their body. We were a part of their body and yep. their body was informed by trauma. So, so is ours. And we, and that is where generational trauma is stored is in our yeah. body. Um, and so I know that I will spend the rest of life because healing isn't a, it isn't a state of a yeah. for me. Healing is yeah. a journey. And it's a journey. And to me, I'm just interested in, yeah, and I too. look back and I think, and I really had, I did this meditation a few weeks ago and I was really, cause I've done a lot of work healing my, my three-year-old mm -hmm. and now the, my teenage self has been begging for attention for a very yeah. long, but I needed to heal the three-year-old self before I could get to the teenage self. Yeah. Um, and, and my 15 year old, you know, we had a talk the other day <laughs> and she is so thankful to be recognized and mm -hmm. to be seen and to be, and very, very proud of it. And I think when we get to a place where we understand that healing is a journey and we get to a place where we recognize that that journey is not about, because because we can even there's so much in some spiritual circles that makes that healing journey like like a competition. Yeah, <laughs> right? I know very few. And, and attaches children. itself to capitalist ideas. Yes. Um, in in ways that are unhealthy, right? And so 
I've come to realize that I'm just interested in the journey. Yeah. It's not, I'm not sitting there with a checklist that's like, we've got to accomplish this thing and this thing and this thing. I put those things aside and I recognize that it's just about the journey. That's it. It's the it's constant just about discovery. getting to know myself. Yeah, yes. It's just about being discovery. curious. Yes. Yeah. And, and I say that all the yeah. time is that curiosity could, will, curiosity will literally save the world. Yes. Right. Because wrapped up in curiosity is vulnerability is mm-hmm. authenticity, is play, is connection, yeah. right? All these things are wrapped up in curiosity, is courage, are wrapped up in curiosity. Um, and if we could really, when we choose to really lean into that, that's when we really change. Because it's not about arriving. There's no such yeah. thing. <laughs> There's no we such arrive thing. when we die. I think even yeah. then we, we haven't arrived because we were, we were still yeah. learning on yeah. the way out. So, yeah. um and that's a shame that society do think that way, that it's an instantaneous thing. And yeah. if you think about that logically, yeah. if growth was instantaneous, where and how would you learn about who right. you are? It doesn't make any right. sense to me. So then no. uh, you, as you stated, the importance and the value of the journey then becomes important when you see as it uh, walks on a daily basis. Talk to me, uh, Shane, about when you began to, um, because I know we all have to come to this space and you are one that has been walking through trauma for many years in your life as you're walking through college, walking through. Um, yeah. When was your day? I tell people there's a day of visitation and some of us, um, it's mm-hmm. not a major thing, but is it is yeah. a an event that arrives into our lives that gives us the opportunity to go, holy cow, I am here again. What yeah. took place? Why am I here? Yeah. All those questions and we began to, and as I mentioned to you earlier, I believe this is the place of honor. This is the opportunity we are we're given one of the most precious gifts, and that is the introduction to self. And yeah. now we have to go on this journey to learn how to forgive ourselves, how to be empathetic, how to love yeah. me in the mess that I am, how to do all of these things here that you hear people talk about. Because when I come out of there, Shane, that is how yeah. I'm going to respond to the world. I'm going to love you based on how I learn to love myself. Yeah. If I don't love myself, there's no way in hell I can ever love you. What is my baseline that yeah. I can use to? So that's yeah. why when people say to me, I said, I ask them, what is your baseline? <laughs> I think I'm, I'm a little nutty when I ask them, what is your yeah. baseline for saying that? But it's a serious question. Are you in love yeah. with yourself? If yeah. you're not, you have no baseline. You cannot yeah. um, guide it as to, okay, yeah, this is love. Yeah. So talk to me about your introduction to your awakening, your day of awakening, and what was it that led to that? Because now this girl has to begin to truly heal. She is going through hell on her. Yeah. So um, I want to preface what I'm about to say by recognizing, and there's a recent study done that neurodivergent, specifically women, are 90, like there's a 90% chance, nine out of 10 neurodivergent women experience sexual assault in their lifetime and most wow. multiple. Um, and so it's really important that, you know, there not be that, that when we are interacting with people, we have an understanding of where they're coming from and understanding of what's going on in their life, right? So many people are like, how is it that you were sexually assaulted so many times? Because mm-hmm. I, because mm-hmm. we have a place of honesty. Yeah. and of truth and we believe other people are the same i now recognize not true um yeah. but have an almost an inability to lie um yeah. and so um so we believe other people are the same and also our flight responses are different there's fight flight freezer and neurodivergent brains are much more likely and which means that our ability to say no our ability to run is literally shut down the brain disassociate mm-hmm because of previous trauma. And there's a lot of yeah. study in the fact that neurodivergence is actually called by PTSD experience as a very, um, and so I didn't know all of it, but three years ago, um, I started to recognize that my healing journey had stalled out mm-hmm. and it was during the pandemic shutdown. And I had moved back home um, to save money 
and to be able to reinvest in my business. And I wasn't sure financially what was going to happen during the pandemic, like if people were going to still hire me as an interior designer. And so I moved back home and I hadn't moved home in 10 years. And that alone was a very traumatic experience. Yeah, um, sure. And so that started it. That started to crack open this journey. And then I was raped. Mm -hmm. um, and that blew the top off of my world. And ooh, the shame storm that hit me. Yeah. Like, how could you let this happen to yourself again? How, how, how come, how come? Um, I was actually injured at the time and the person took advantage of that and stole my cell phone and, you know, perpetrated what he wanted. Um, and so I really had to stop and say, like, are you really letting yourself be yourself? Because I knew what I wanted to do in the world, but I was mm -hmm. denying myself permission. I knew that I had already been working with clients around life design and that conversation was so powerful. And yet I was yeah. denying myself access to allow my true self and that conversation to take up space in the world. It was imposter syndrome. Like yeah. I felt like I didn't have the right to, sh to talk about these things in a larger platform, actually share them in a larger way. I could only do it through interior design because that's what my degree was in. Yeah. And that's all anyone would care about. And Honestly, being raped is probably the best thing that ever happened to me while it was also the worst and it didn't yeah. actually have to happen mm -hmm. um, for me to learn these things, but it did and I did and I made something good of it and I went back to therapy um, and I started journaling again and I started getting real with myself and I started writing again. Writing was always my safe space. Mm -hmm. um, I say the, the, the page never judges, only people do. Yeah. We can put anything we want on a piece of paper, any thought, any feeling. We can we can write it all, every bit of pain or joy, or so, all of it. We can really learn to feel our feelings when we write it down. We can see what they really are in a more perfect way. And so I started leaning back into that healing journey and letting myself take up space and knowing that I needed to learn more about being neurodivergent and that there was a lot more emerging research. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is it's never been studied in women. It's only ever been studied in men. And so there all the all the tools that I had been given previously were for were all were mm. specifically meant for men and they did not work. Yeah. And so discovering my own journey and discovering what it is to be female or to be a woman, um, yeah. someone with internal genitalia and be neurodivergent was a really important thing. And so finding community around that was mm. really important and I've done that. And finding there's this con there's this thing that we do as neurodivergent people called masking and we mask to create ourselves as normal to create a normal facade so that people will accept us so that neurotypical people will not recognize our neurodivergent and it's a very emotionally exhausting mm -hmm. um in which we're literally denying our actual holding yeah. our actual self back and building a wall between who we really are and the world and i decided in that that i was going to spend I was going to spend as little time as possible in my life masking and that if I needed to mask, it was somebody I didn't need to be around yeah. or a situation I did not to be in. And giving permission to mask was the most thing. And that is the thing that changed me, is just being able to allow myself to take up space as a neurodivergent person in this world and letting that take up space, right? Um, mm. And letting me take up space. And so that that changed my, you know, as another life changing moment, there's been all these traumatic things that changed me. Yeah. Um, but that particular, I don't make any self that ask anyone. And I was so, self apologizing for being urgent. Yeah. I think it, you're, um, listening to your story, I think you're so special in many ways because, um, there has been no research, um, about that. And here you from the female side and yeah. here you are. Isn't that perfect? <laughs> yeah. And so, you are now giving yourself the opportunity to be and walk into your I am. Yeah. And um, when we get there, Shana, it is it's painful. It's usually a painful, traumatic situation that brings us there because then we get a chance to sit on the floor or on the bed and cry and yep. cry and cry and yep. cry. And yep. after we've emptied out all of we'll that, cry again. <laughs> <laughs> we then cry again. And because we're having to deal with the shame, that yeah. um, that part of how did I allow this to happen again? Yeah. And yeah. Um, shame is one of the most destroying things on this yeah. planet. Um, yes. And people use it to control others. And to me, that's yeah. 
um, the, the thought of that, my skin crawls because that to me yeah. is just evil as you come that people can do that, but they're out there. Um, yeah. someone like you, I always say to people, even it's, 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 it's just anyone. Um, the inner man, Shana, they don't know how to control that, but all of our sensitive, their senses, they have learned to manipulate. Mm -hmm. Um, at being who you are, did your inner man begin to shout and say, when you meet some of these people, red light, red light, red light? Did, did it always that, has. And, it always and has. That's, the, that's the thing I always tell people. Always has. That's who yeah. we are. And when yeah. we recognize that person, yeah. I look back at all my life problems and yeah. relationships is because I've gone past that. And, and, yes. and I, I yeah. never paid attention to that. And I, yeah. I usually ask people that one question. And every yep. single one of them, Shannon will tell me yes. And so then I re I, I've come to believe yeah. that that's us, our true self, trying yeah. to come out. The I am, yeah. if you yeah. will, trying yeah. to come out, recognizing who has presented and is yeah. trying to bring the information to us. But we yeah. look at their external. They're handsome. They're beautiful. They love the same music I do. I have. I feel yeah. so good being around them. All that it kind of even, stuff. It wasn't even that for me. It was that. So neurodivergent people t take in more information than other people. So your brain, mm -hmm. a neurotypical person brain, filters out a lot of information. Only allows you to recognize what you care about. Yeah. It's filtering out everything you have decided is extraneous. My brain doesn't do that. My yeah. brain is taking immense amount of information and processing, processing it, and this like ten exponentially faster, right? Mm -hmm. And so we tend to be very intuitive people. Yeah. Um, the problem is that my entire life I was told that my intuition was me being judgmental or disrespectful, yeah. that I had no proof. And because I didn't have proof or couldn't verbally explain why I knew what, I, yeah. what my intuition was. Mm -hmm. And it was constantly, I was constantly proofed and yet yeah. it was invalid constantly. And so you get to the place where you yourself, because you have yeah. been so invalid. Yes. And so that, that was a sinister part. And so I had to get to a place where I love and trust and validate myself and do not look for validation externally yes. at all. And so that's where I finally got after that rape three years ago. I got to the place where I was like, can I say bad words? Go ahead, say it. <laughs> fuck everyone yeah. and fuck their thoughts about yeah. who I am. Yeah. Because I know who I am and I know what I know and I do not need to prove it. Yeah. I do not need to prove it. I love myself and I am not coming from a place of judgment. If my if my intuition tells me that person is not safe, then I'm not safe. Yeah. And I'm not gonna stick around to prove it to find out and get hurt first. Yes. And I and I have been living my life from a place of feeling like I had to stick around until the person proved it. And by that time it was too it was too late. Too late. Yeah. It was too late and I was having to deal with the aftermath. Yes. And I was like, enough. That is no. not going to be the story of my life dealing with the aftermath of other people proving they're terrible to me. Yeah. Um, and so I just stopped and I let all these relationships fall away. Mm -hmm. And I just surrounded myself with the people who honor and trust and know and do not believe that they have a right to insert their opinion if I do not ask. Like they honor and respect boundaries and consent, yes. period. <laughs> That's it. Boundaries is a part of uh, growth, and it's very important. I tell people: do not be afraid of boundaries. No, it is designed to yes. save you. It is designed to protect you. It is designed for you to gain uh, your peace. It is designed. Yeah. It is purposeful. It is not. And as you you dictate, you know, to hell with all those people and what yes. they think. The important entity is you. And yes. you have to be able to manage you and let mm -hmm. those people manage themselves. As you're walking and you, you came to this realization, and it's a powerful place to be because it's that space what I call freedom. It's your independence. You began yeah. to walk on your own, as they say, um, standing in your oneness, your I amness, as you began to get a glimpse of who you are internally and the power that is you. How did you now, you have these clients and you're putting all these things and I could see the easy progression by which it can manifest. But talk to me as to how did it move from the internal uh, interior uh, with the houses as you began to move even further into the, the space of individuals, your 
with the development of your different types of workshop? How did you begin to formulate yeah. that? And um, what was the uh, nexus that caused you to go, okay, um, let me do this? Um, I needed to give myself some time to heal from from what was going on in my yeah. life internally and to let myself actually take up space and to mm-hmm. learn how to take up space. And so I gave myself a lot of time to do that. Um, what I had been doing, so for two and a half years, I led group coaching yeah. um, around the concepts of life design. And okay. once when I was raped, I put, I put a pause on that. Yeah. Um, but I had seen, I mean, when I say this group coaching over two and a half years, I worked with a hundred people and it was a racially diverse, um, gender diverse group, which is unheard of, right? Yeah. For a group of people to be 50% male, I, male identifying and 50% female identifying, um, and racially diverse and culturally diverse mm-hmm. is unheard of. And so I recognized how powerful that was, yeah. right? But then this moment happened and I needed, it was like I needed that moment to happen to push me to the yeah. next, right? Because I was still playing small. Yeah. And and so once I worked through my healing, I was like, okay, now we're going to get back to it. We're going to take all these principles that we've been working with people for two and a half years and we're going to turn them into workshops. And then, you know, record. Uh, right now I'm working on recording all of those workshops so that mm-hmm. people can just download them and work through them on their own if they want, or they can participate in live workshops um, through zoom or the next iteration is us being able to come together in, 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 in real life, you know, come together as human beings and be in the same space together Um, and really share that message with more people because I saw how it applies to every single person on the planet in real time. And so that really just became a place of recognizing, okay, enough playing small. You don't have to mm-hmm. ask for permission. And who would you ask for permission anyway? From, yeah. Mm-hmm. Who would I ask? I would only <laughs> ask me. I'm the only person yeah. who has the right to say yes or no. And so yeah. I say, yes, let's do it. Right? <laughs> and so, you know, I learned through that group group coaching um, during that time as I started my business and taking it full time. So mm-hmm. I started my business about six years ago now, took it full time, three and a half, almost four years ago. Um, and then started to be able to really play with it and be like, what do I actually want it to be? Who do I actually want to be in this world? Who do I know myself to be? Not who I want to be. Who do I know myself to be? And then letting that take up space. And so that was that iteration. And I was working as an interior designer while leading this group coaching. And at the time they felt separate. Mm -hmm. And I realized they're not separate at all. They're in fact the same thing. (laughs) They're the exact same thing. Um, And so there, there you have it. Yeah, I, I think they are. And I, I'm and in the individual that is before me, um, the insight of the um, the business, the profession and yeah. the insight uh, in the business and the profession of the spiritual realm in the learning of you, the I am, as yeah. you put those two blended together, which is one. And I tell people this. The journey is designed to do a couple of things. First, to introduce you to you, who yeah. you are, the greatness, the beauty, the power, all of those yeah. things. Uh, Shane, I fell in love with this guy, Ken Primus. I, I used to yeah. walk around and kiss my hand and just, I, I fell in love with my color. Yeah. I fell in love with things because I walked in shame. And so yeah. when I began to switch it around and change the perspective, I yeah. just love this man. He's not per- yeah. per- perfect. And I think perfection is the enemy there's of no such growth. Thing. Yeah. And, there's no such um, thing. There's no such thing. And so um, growth is designed to expand you. And yeah. as I began to learn who I am and uh, uh, develop and found my gift, and I tell people the, the journey is to introduce you to you, you then yeah. locate your gift that you have yeah. within you and then yeah. you present it in a format by which now you are going to live number yes. one and yeah. it will be able and it's designed in such a way that it will sustain you because we are programmed to believe that there is only security and working in corporate america and the um no it is not true <laughs> It is, yeah, there's it no is, such thing as security. There's I know. No such thing. <laughs> and so as you begin to live your journey, your life is this space by which then it is designed. It is, it can sustain you, but it allows you 
to continue this journey and yeah. uh, expand yourself and expand your knowledge and you're able to become even a much more of a servant where you're yeah. serving and to live in that space yeah uh, shane is one of the most honor uh i can't even it to me it is exciting it is it is uh, a place of uh, joy it's a different yeah. place until you get there you won't know what we're talking about yeah and um, talk to me as you walk in that workshop shane and you get a chance to watch the eyes and as a revelation began to walk into this the mind of that individual and they began to get to a place where they're going wait a minute i'm i'm seeing it i'm seeing who i am and yeah. you are there to experience that talk to me about one of those events and how did it affect i know how it is going to affect you but talk yeah. to me about what it did to that individual as they realized yeah i i am if yeah. you will you know the most powerful switch that i see happen over and over again through these the conversation around life design is that people recognize that they don't actually need other people's opinion yeah. right that they have permission we 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 may need to or want to and and this is part of community is gaining knowledge and understanding from others mm -hmm. but we don't gain perspective on ourselves from other people necessarily yeah. right like we're mm -hmm. not we shouldn't be looking it's not beneficial to ask someone's opinion about our life no. about about unless they're a trusted advisor and even then it should be used sparingly yes <laughs> right? i think so we we you don't need permission and you should stop asking yeah. because it's it's no one else can give you permission and and i a you know there was a woman i was talking to and she came up to me after a talk and she was like hey you know there's these posters on my wall from concerts and i you know i i know it's childish and i should take them down and i was like hold on what do you mean she's like well i'm in the middle of a divorce and so when i moved into my own place i put these posters up on the wall and i was like okay now let's dive into that Mm -hmm. what about those posters you love? Why did you take the time to put them up? Yeah. And she's like, well, I love going to concerts. I love, you know, that moment, you know, with the crowd and all the people and going with my friends and okay, great. So did you feel like a part of that you were denying or not able to be fully yourself when you were married? Yes, she didn't. She didn't feel like she could. I said, so what I think, what I'm seeing is that those posters remind you of your wild. They remind mm -hmm. you of who you really are and what brings you joy and what brings you connection and, and part of your authentic self and, and what allows you to really feel joy in your life. They absolutely belong up on. And perhaps the only switch that needs to happen is that maybe you need to know how powerful they are and show them the honor they deserve. Yeah. And perhaps that is putting them in a frame if they're not already framed, which you could do pretty expensively, inexpensively, mm -hmm. you know, just go to Walmart and get a poster frame, you know, something inexpensive, yep. you know, divorces are crazy expensive. So I get yeah. that you might have the funds to do anything. But for now, you know, you could you find expensive ways or maybe you forgo the framing and you just make sure you're on your own in a way that feels purposeful and intentional. Just be more intentional about them being yeah. shown them honor and let them let yourself take up space and she and i could see this that happened yeah. and i was like yeah, you don't need my permission to be it's your mm. home no one else gets an opinion it's your life no one yeah. else gets an opinion that you don't give them no one else has power you don't give them um and that is the most amazing shift because it's at that moment that someone's like they start to recognize the ways in which they have been inhibiting themselves because other people have been inhibiting them by putting yeah. their fear on us right and we've been governing our lives with other people's rules and other people's fear and we don't have to yeah. and the minute we recognize we don't have to we we don't see it like for me it's not about rebellion i'm not rebelling against society no. i simply choose not to because rebellion means that I recognize something else has authority over me and I am mm -hmm. choosing to push against that authority. But yeah. if instead I recognize that nothing has authority in my life, I do not give it, there is no rebellion. Yes. There's no such thing. That's not a real concept. It is simply that I exist and I get to take up space and that's it. That's it. And that's the switch, the very powerful switch that I see happen when I have these conversations with people. All of a sudden, they re recognize they get to give themselves a period. Shannon, this has been and such a powerful conversation. And I just want to 
Uh, thank you, because I've learned a lot. And, I, and as mentioned on the onset, guys, you didn't know I was behaving like a little child when she <laughs> came on because I was so excited to have this conversation uh, because I saw the deepness that is her. And I was excited to bring her to you so that you will be able to get a chance to partake of her wisdom, her knowledge, her pain, her sacrifice, all of it, so that you can taste and become victorious and become you as you begin to learn about who you are. I invite all of you to um, get into her space. I will provide all of that so that you can get into her workshop, get into this woman's space because she hasn't even started and we've been talking about an hour and change. Trust me, I could sense it. I feel that she hasn't even started yet. So I want you to get into her space, um, become a disciple, if you will, because disciples are the ones that change the world. Not Don't yeah. become a church member, as they say. No. Become a disciple so yes. that you can change the world. A disciple yeah. is one that takes the information um, and just regurgitate it and bring it out in yeah. their own fashion. There I am. And I yeah. thank you so much, Shana, for coming to Threads of Alignment and gracing us with your power. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I I very much enjoyed talking with you. And I thank you for honoring me and in your space the way you have it. Thank you. It is my pleasure and honor.